What's up, everybody? Rob here. So this is a continuation of my look at the Thirty Years' War, or more accurately, this is the beginning of my look at the Thirty Years' War. In the previous episode of this series, I looked at the Holy Roman Empire and the general state of Europe, but now we're going to be going into the narrative, and I'm going to be talking about the defenestration of Prague, in which three imperial officials were thrown unceremoniously out of a window in the Bohemian capital, leading to the Bohemian Revolt, which eventually would lead to the Thirty Years' War and engulf all of Europe. It is generally considered by historians to be the start of the conflict, and I'm going to be going into the narrative into the lead-up and outbreak of this particular incident. So, without any further ado, a very brief look at the defenestration of Prague. So, just to recap a bit, the Peace of Augsburg in 1555 established a sort of religious freedom within the Holy Roman Empire. Now, let me just explain this a bit. It was religious freedom for the rulers. If you were a nobleman who ruled a province of the empire, you had the freedom to choose whichever religion you want. You could either become Catholic or you could become Lutheran. And whatever religion you chose had to be followed by the rest of your subjects. So if you were a Catholic ruler, all of your subjects would have to be Catholic. Any Lutherans, or eventually there would be other Protestant denominations who lived in your realm, had to either convert or they had to leave. Now, now I'm sure there are people out there who practiced in secret, and there are people who practiced the opposite religion openly, um, and the ruler just didn't care because either he just wanted to keep peace or wasn't strong enough to impose his will on his subjects, or really probably just didn't care one way or another. But um, generally speaking, if the ruler was Catholic, the land as a whole was Catholic, and vice versa with Lutheranism. Now, there is a bit of a problem here in that they didn't actually say anything about the Calvinists. More on these guys in a future episode. Uh, the reason for this is that when the Peace of Augsburg was signed, there weren't any Calvinist rulers, and um, they just nobody ever bothered to think about them. However, in the intervening decades, the number of Calvinists within the empire increased, and this led to a degree of friction. The Calvinists thought that they were not being represented properly because, well, they weren't. And uh, this led to, of course, some degree of friction. Now, for example, there was in 1608 an imperial diet or an imperial um, a council amongst the various leaders of the Holy Roman Empire in which the terms of the Peace of Augsburg would be reconfirmed. But this led to a bit of a problem when Catholics insisted that former ecclesiastical or you know, church official church property be returned to Catholic rule. Basically, one of the provisions of the Peace of Augsburg was that in Lutheran lands, church property there would be secularized. Basically, it would be turned over to the secular authorities, in this case, Lutherans. The Catholics asked that this land and this property be returned to the Catholic Church. Calvinists just up and walked out as a form of protest because they felt that their own personal agenda and their own personal interests weren't being looked towards. Uh, they tried this again, another imperial diet, diet in 1613, and this led to another walkout. Now, tensions were flaring up all around the Holy Roman Empire amongst the various religious factions. Uh, not quite out-and-out -out rebellion, but definitely there was a great degree of tension there, and it was just a powder keg ready to explode. And in order to ca calm everything down, you needed a really strong hand on the tiller. You needed somebody who's just incredibly competent, has a strong force of personality, some strong leader to really impose his will on his subjects to keep them in line. What they got was Rudolf II. Rudolf II succeeded his father Maximilian as Holy Roman Emperor in 1576. Unfortunately for the empire, which needed a strong hand to guide it, he cared very little for the affairs of state. Now, he was a great patron of the arts and the sciences, and he also had a major interest in alchemy and the occult. And at the time, those four subjects were more similar than they were different. That's the pre-enlightenment for you. In any event, during the course of his reign, he suffered a severe mental breakdown. Now, this possibly was due to depression or bipolar disorder. It's very difficult to diagnose somebody that far in the past. But in any event, he almost completely withdrew from public life and was increasingly hands-off of his governmental duties. There were many flare-ups of religious tensions during his reign. For example, you have the Calvinists who were starting to assert themselves as a power, and they felt that they were cheated because they were not mentioned in the Peace of Augsburg, which they're not. And they wanted to assert their authority. Also, continual issues about the Peace of Augsburg and the details and the interpretation of it. And it needed the strong hand of the emperor to help guide the empire during this very difficult time. And he was simply not there to provide that guiding hand. When he did try to exert imperial authority, it was usually more of a disaster than it was of any help. One of the worst incidents was something known as the Long War, 
which was a conflict fought against the Ottoman Empire between 1593 and 1606. They think 13 years is a long war. They have no idea what they're in for. And it's sometimes referred to as kind of a preview of the 30 Years' War. A lot of commanders during the 30 Years' War would actually get their first taste of combat during this conflict. Uh, Count Wallenstein was there, a couple others. We'll get to those in later episodes. In any case, Rudolf used this as actually a way to unify his empire. See, because the Ottomans are predominantly a Muslim power and they were constantly encroaching into Europe. So he thought, okay, look, we can unify the varying squabbling factions within the Holy Roman Empire. You know, the Catholics, the Lutherans, and the Calvinists, and there's, you know, whatever other branches we have out there, whatever, you know, offshoots, Anabaptists, etc. We can unify us all together against a common non-Christian enemy. And on paper, that seems like, okay, that's a great idea. Except he handled it completely horribly and made things far worse for himself. So the Ottomans were actually very initially successful and they were pushing deeper and deeper into Europe and capturing major portions of Habsburg lands. But during the course of the conflict, two predominantly Christian provinces within the Ottoman Empire, Wallachia and Moldovia, revolted. And the Ottomans were losing ground trying to contain the rebellion. Now, Rudolf was a very staunch and devout Catholic and wanted to increase the power and influence of the Catholic Church and undermine the Protestant factions within his empire. Yes, he was trying for a degree of unity, but if the Catholics could end up on top, he would be totally fine with that. So what he did was he tried to start a revolution in the province of Transylvania, which was also under Ottoman rule, to overthrow its Ottoman overlords. And he also tried to restore Catholic supremacy within the region. Now, this is a horribly bad idea because the region has virtually no Catholic population at this point. It was mostly made up of Lutherans, Calvinists, and Orthodox. And even other Catholic nobles within his reign who were totally on the counter-Reformation bandwagon thought this was a horrible idea. So when the Imperial Army left Hungary and Transylvania to fight off an Ottoman advance, Transylvania erupted in revolt, and this revolt eventually spread to other parts of Habsburg holdings, including Bohemia, which is now the Czech Republic. Rudolf was barely able to maintain any sort of control over these regions, and he was forced to give many concessions to the Protestants, including something known as the Letter of Majesty, which we will get into in a little bit. But overall, he was a rather ineffective ruler, and it was, and it has been determined by many historians that his actions, or rather his inactions, as well as his just general mismanagement of the empire, basically laid the groundwork for the outbreak of the Thirty Years' War. And at the end of his reign, he was having his power stripped away from him slowly by one of his brothers, by the name of Matthias, who was elected King of Bohemia in 1611 and the Holy Roman Emperor in 1612. Now, Matthias was much more relaxed in his religious policy than his brother. He was much more tolerant of the Protestants, didn't really care about undermining them or trying to promote Catholic supremacy. He was actually fairly laissez-faire, not in a I'm not going to rule way like Rudolf, but more like, hey, as long as you maintain the peace, pay your taxes, and don't cause any problems, you know, do whatever you want. He did have a genuine desire to mollify the Protestants that were under his rule, and he was generally more tolerant than his predecessor, but he was also forced to be after his brother's mistakes. He was forced to give in to multiple Protestant demands, otherwise he would lose control of areas that were under Habsburg dominion. Uh, the main, Now, this reconciliation was all well and good, and things were going fairly smoothly during his reign. The problem was that he was aging and in poor health when he took over the throne, and he had no heirs. So his heir apparent was his younger brother, Ferdinand of Styria and the Archduke of Austria. So as Matthias was already in poor health, he abdicated the kingdom of Bohemia in 1617 and arranged for Ferdinand to take over. And this is where things get interesting. Now, Ferdinand is much more hardline Catholic than his predecessors. He was actively involved in the Counter-Reformation, which is exactly what it sounds like. And he was educated in his youth by the Jesuits, and because of this, he developed a very pious and hardworking personality. He was a very energetic ruler, throwing himself into the affairs of statecraft. And in addition to this, he was also fond of physical activities, for example, hunting, which produced a great deal of very rich and dense foods. And eventually, over the course of his reign, he would put on a great deal of weight, but even still, it did very little to slow him down. He, unlike most of his contemporaries, was avoidant of heavy drinking because you know germans in their beer well they kind of go 
search your feelings, you know it's true. And in addition to this, he also wore a hair shirt to suppress his carnal urges. And unlike his predecessors, he never took a mistress. In the words of papal nuncio Carlo Carafa, and I quote here, He goes to bed around 10 in the evening, as is the German custom. He is already up around 4 in the morning or earlier. Once he has got up, his majesty goes to the chapel to hear two masses, one for the soul of his first wife, who, though shaky of health, was tenderly loved by the emperor. If it is a feast day, the emperor takes Holy Communion, for which purpose he goes to the church and hears a German sermon. This usually, this is usually given by a Jesuit and lasts half an hour. After the sermon, he remains at the high altar, usually for about an hour and a half, accompanied by specially selected music. On those days that there are not feast days, the emperor, after attending two masses, something from which he never deviates, spends the rest of the morning and often much of the afternoon in council meetings. So unlike his two brothers, he was actually very hardworking and very much throwing himself into the affairs of state. He was not laissez-faire at all and was very happy to attend council meetings and basically micromanage the empire. Now, he was very devout and he was a counter-reformer, but he wasn't completely a fanatic. Um, he didn't like, you know, specifically persecute the Protestants, but at the same time, it was basically clear that he would definitely support his Catholic co-religionists over his Lutheran and Calvinist subjects. This would no doubt cause conflicts in Bohemia, which he was made king of in 1617. Now, Bohemia, which is now the modern day Czech Republic or Czechia, or you know, honestly, whatever you guys are calling yourselves now, really, it's hard to keep track, is no stranger to religious conflicts. Now, centuries earlier, it had been home to Jan Hus, who, like Luther, was a reformer who demanded reforms within the Catholic Church, and for his efforts was burned at the stake for this. And this led to the Hussite Wars, which I actually have a video on, and you should totally check that out, because I care not for once of you's commonly that they do. Any case, it was in Bohemia that the Letter of Majesty was signed in 1609 by Rudolf II. Now, this document granted Protestants of Bohemia, which was the majority of the population at the time, equal rights to their Catholic counterparts. Each noble, knight, and royal town within Bohemia was allowed to choose their own religion and appoint a group of defensors, or as the name implies, defenders, people who were there to maintain and oversee these newly acquired rights. This in effect created a parallel government to the Habsburg ones. The, in the event of a grievance of some kind, they could go to the defensors as opposed to a Habsburg-appointed judge or Habsburg authority. Now, the Habsburgs were still in control, but it was a little bit more chipping away of their authority. The Protestants seized the opportunities presented and would eventually take over Prague University and the Utrechtist Consistory Court. Basically, they were separating themselves legally from the Habsburgs. Rudolf and later Matthias were actually fine with this. They were more interested in making peace rather than exerting imperial authority. Ferdinand, not so much. Now, the issue was an interpretation of the Letter of Majesty. The Protestants believed that the Letter of Majesty extended not only to lands held by Protestant nobility, but also lands being held directly by the king as well. And as a result, they started building churches in what were essentially royal lands, not lands held by Protestant nobles, but directly held by the king. Rudolf and Matthias were more than happy to let this go, again being very conciliatory. Ferdinand, being much more hardlined, was not a fan of this. He stated that the Protestants, yes, you can in fact build on royal lands, you can build your churches there, that's fine, but you have to do so with royal consent. And he did not consent. So he ordered that Protestant churches that were under construction on his lands to be pulled down, and two were. One at Braunau, which is now Brumov, and one at Klostergrab, which is now Ronby. As you can imagine, pulling down churches tends to not really endear yourself too much with people, and the Protestants were absolutely outraged by this. And the defensors, who were there to oversee and uphold the rights granted to them by the Letter of Majesty, were also equally outraged, and they sent a formal complaint to Ferdinand. And as a result of this, Ferdinand had their council dissolved. The Protestant defensors, upon learning that their council had been dissolved, gave up and went for home, knowing they couldn't possibly compete with Habsburg authority. No, I'm just messing with you. They actually got completely enraged, and a group of Protestant leadership, led by Count Matthias Thurn, stormed into Rakani Palace in Prague on May 23, 1618. Once there, they encountered Ferdinand's representatives, Count Willem Slavata of Cholm and Count Yaroslav Berita of Martinice. Now, the 
Defensers wanted to know if these were the men who were responsible for the dissolution of the council, as well as the repeal of various provisions within the Letter of Majesty. And after a very long, heated exchange, it was eventually admitted by these two men that, yes, they were the ones, in fact, responsible. Uh, they were working on Ferdinand's orders, but ultimately it came through them, and they had a degree of responsibility in this. Now, both men then agreed to be taken into custody, figuring that, okay, tempers are flaring right now, let's agree to be taken into custody, and we'll sort this out later, kind of trying to defuse the situation. And they were then seized by the defensers, at which point they went to the nearby window, 70 feet above the ground, and Martinez was thrown out of the window, plunging 70 feet straight down. They then grabbed Slavata and they threw him out too. Now, Slavata actually made things a little bit more difficult for them. He struggled and fought against his attackers, and when they threw him out, he actually grabbed the ledge, and it took them several moments for the defensers to uh, basically pry his fingers off. They beat at his hands, and eventually, with massive cuts and bruising on his hands, was forced to let go, and he too fell 70 feet to the ground below. And then just for good measure, just for the sake of completeness, they grabbed Philip Fabricus, who just happened to be the secretary of the two men, and they found him cowering in the corner, and they grabbed him, and they chucked him out the window too. Because, sure, why not? Now, there's actually some debate over what happened next. It depends on who you talk to. Now, the Catholics say that it was either Virgin Mary or possibly angels descending from heaven, and that they were cushioned in their fall by the intervention of either angels or, in some variant of the story, uh, Virgin Mary. Uh, now, the Protestants claim that they fell in a dung heap. Um, it, I leave it up to your own interpretations. I am giving no particular opinion as to what exactly happened. Um, either way, all three men actually did survive the fall and were able to re report back to Ferdinand what had happened. And um, interestingly enough, uh, Fabricus, the secretary, was given the title of Count Hohenfall, which means Count Highfall, because German humor, I guess. I, I don't know. Whatever. Uh, with this action, a line had been crossed and the Bohemian Revolt had begun and leading to eventually, per capita, the deadliest conflict in Germany's history and would eventually embroil Europe in absolute madness and chaos for the next three decades. So that is it for the video about the defenestration of Prague. I wanted to just give you a brief overview as to what happened and just give you kind of a background for it. Uh, there is a lot more going on here. This is an absolutely massive subject. Uh, for example, the incident which um, Matthias... Uh, gradually was taking control of the Holy Roman Empire and Bohemia from his brother, and um, you know, Rudolf was basically you know shoved out of the way. That's a very, very long, complicated process that took a very long time. I just glossed over it because you know I want to get on with the narrative here, and I want to get on to the actual conflict. And um, so, yes, I did have to cut out a lot of stuff here, but I think you did get the gist of what's going on. In any case, that is it for this video. Please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos coming out whenever I get around to it, and have a good day. Or don't have a good day. Your adults have any kind of day you want. See you later.